Hey everybody, it's Christina Holloway here. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we're going to talk about using some effective communication skills at work that will help you clear away confusion and misunderstandings while also helping you create some clear direction for yourself. I talk a lot about communication because Personally, it's the biggest skill you have in your arsenal to help you regain control over situations, define who you are at work, and set clear boundaries around expectations. This video is part one because there's just so much. I'm breaking it down into these 10 elements and we're going to talk about the first five here today. Also, this year I'm sharing 12 leadership metrics that will help you succeed in your career. This is pretty much a full framework for how to develop your skills to build your career. This month, we're talking about effective communication strategies. You can catch up on all the videos in the playlist on my YouTube channel. Everything's linked below in the description. And communication is so important that it has its own playlist also, which I've called the Communication Toolkit. Make sure to check it out. Real quick, if you enjoy this content and want to learn more about how to make power moves in your career, make sure to follow my channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss a video from me. All right, so let's get started. Number one, practice active listening. First, communication is more than just what you say and how you say it. It's also about what you don't say, how you listen, and literally how you respond with your physical being. Once you unlock some effective communication strategies that help you elevate your communication style, you'll begin to influence the people around you without having to talk so much, if you get my drift. One way to do this is to practice active listening. It takes practice, but the more you do it, and especially the more you have awareness that you're doing it, the more effective it becomes. Now, the most common example of active listening is to paraphrase what the other person is saying, but try not to overdo it. I worked with someone who constantly repeated what I said, and I finally asked, are you trying to active listen me? <laughs> and she said, yes, <laughs> which made me realize that maybe I was sharing information too fast or I was not keeping good pace in the conversation. So the way to use active listening and to make it work to your advantage is to actually repeat a point you heard, but also use it to carry the conversation forward. Let me just repeat your last point so I understand. You're asking for additional funds for this project because we'll be adding another element that we hadn't anticipated before. Is that right? Okay, so what are we trying to decide in this meeting? What do you need from me? There are two elements here. Element one, let me get clarification. Let me make sure I understood you correctly. Element two, ask for action. What action do I need to take as we continue with this conversation? Active listening works in a lot of areas too. Just so I understand, are you saying the conflict between these two colleagues is causing problems? If that's the case, what do you propose we do about it? How would you like me to intervene? Active listening is about creating chapters in the conversation, so to speak, that allow you to break it up and get a better understanding of your role in that discussion. It also helps you figure out what the person is really getting at. Sometimes people really need to unload. Active listening can help break up the conversation so that the other person can figure out how to find a solution to the problem. It's a really powerful tool. Number two, clear and concise communication. This one is great. I work with people at the very top who need to relearn how to use this, and there's a reason. You probably started your career young and brash with great ideas and you popped off in enough meetings that you finally started to hear that you needed to wait your turn. Other people thought of that already, or it was important to propose your ideas first in hopes that they would be considered. You were sidelined. As you continued on your career, you learned how to make your ask in the most polite manner so as not to ruffle feathers. And by the time you finally reached an executive position, you may have gotten so used to using a lot of fluff around proposing new and innovative ideas that you forgot how to be direct without creating conflict. This happens. I work with plenty of people who are entering the executive suite and the feedback to them is to be more direct, own their space, be less hesitant. Okay, but they spent so much time unlearning how to be unique and original that they now have to relearn it for a bigger role. It's probably familiar to you too. You might be used to saying, if you have time, could you please review my proposal? I don't mean to bother you, but I'm going to need that report by Friday. Hey, well, Friday comes and goes. 
and we all know how that plays out. Clear and concise communication is about getting to the point, holding your authority, and still acting in the most professional manner possible. This report needs to go to the CFO on Friday. That means we need to review your version on Thursday what's on your plate that could cause a problem with a Thursday deadline. My executive director asked me to run this proposal past you this week. I have time to talk on Wednesday. If you're unavailable, I'll need to let the ED know that this will be delayed. What does your calendar look like? And if you've watched enough of my videos, you would know that these are examples of ask statements. No more yes or no questions. State your situation explain the timeline, and then ask how to make it happen. This is a powerful way to clean up soft communication that is backfiring on you. And the higher up you go in an organization, the more your leadership team will appreciate your communication style. Get to the point and let me know how I can help you. This also works with people who really aren't living up to expectations or people who really don't know how to manage their time. You're creating priorities and urgency and you're pulling them forward with your directives. Number three, use nonverbal communication. So if you've ever been on the receiving end of this statement, you will know what this one is all about. You know, you're saying yes, you can handle it, but you don't look that confident about taking on these extra tasks. Really? Did the look of terror on my face give away my real feelings about taking on yet another task that I don't have time for and can't fathom how I'm gonna fit it in? So we all use nonverbal communication. We just do it unconsciously. From this point forward, however, you want to start using it with awareness. It's yet one more way you can get your message across without having to interrupt the flow of conversation. I use this technique all the time. My favorite expressions are abject horror and Complete bewilderment. <laughs> and hey, that's a good idea. Name your facial expressions. You'll be able to pull them out when you need them. I was just in a committee meeting with a new group of people and someone said something super crazy and outside of the agenda. I made a complete bewilderment face and people noticed. Some people laughed and that interrupted his thoughts. Then the chair of the committee immediately stopped him and said, that was outside the scope. And let's defer his point for another time. Did the committee chair do it because of me? I'm not so sure about that, but I do know the look on my face helped her create a moment where she could regain control of the conversation. You don't have to be comical, but using confusion, disbelief, sorrow, and excitement through nonverbal cues is going to help you make an impression without needing to exhaust yourself with more words. You'll get responses like, Bob, you look confused. Do you want to ask a question here? Where did we lose you? Why, yes, thank you for giving me the opportunity to explain how crazy that last idea was. The point of nonverbal cues is to create animation in your existence. Use your body to communicate how you're feeling and what you're thinking. And also, this is about building your career and building your reputation at work. Use it to create an atmosphere with people that they want to work with you more. Start with putting your shoulders back, using eye contact, smiling, and engaging through positivity. Awareness in this area especially is going to go a long way in changing how people perceive you. It's very subliminal, but it's very powerful. Number four, embrace empathy. Empathy is not about saying, I feel so sorry for you that you're sick. Empathy is saying, I can relate to you catching COVID. I had it last year and it was hard. What can I do to make things easier for you this week? That's empathy. And if they come back and say, can you take all my work this week? You can respond with, I have bandwidth to take two items. Which ones are the most important to get done? That's empathy and boundaries. Feeling sorry for someone can put you in a position of taking on their problems because you want to fix the situation. Having empathy means you can relate to their problem and give something to help without sacrificing your own well-being or position to do it. To practice empathy, it's simple. Stop saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that happened to you, or I'm sorry you're going through that. There's a bigger reason behind this. Saying I'm sorry is a habit that people have picked up as a blanket statement that's supposed to encompass empathy, sympathy, apologies, and boundaries. Just don't use it anymore. And if the best way to break this habit is to start using something else in the meantime, say, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Once you get into empathy, you'll realize, just like everything else in this video, that you're no longer a person who is a receptacle for other people's problems. You're now a problem solver. 
Seriously, that's the point of effective communication in the workplace, how to get out of problematic situations and move into solving problems so you can get other things done. As a problem solver, you set yourself up for bigger things. Empathy is about sharing in that experience, walking alongside that person as they feel their feels, and then asking what can be done going forward to resolve this situation and continue on your merry way. Once you become a problem solver who uses empathy to create connection and trust, the sky's the limit, really. Number five, practice constructive feedback. I have a video on this and I'll link it here. We're moving away from constructive criticism. Using the word criticism is really counterproductive. No one, no one picks up on the constructive. They just focus on criticism. If you want to be taken seriously at work, spend less time telling people what they did wrong and encourage them to continue contributing with their strengths and where they're doing well. If you do have to give feedback, position it as a way for you to have a discussion around metrics, deliverables, and expectations. None of this is about performance reviews right now. Sometimes you need to be direct with a performance review, but that's not what this is about. We're talking about leading a project and having to work with someone who is struggling or who has asked for advice or clarification. Your best approach is to sit down, ask open-ended questions about how that person is doing, and help them find solutions to their own problems. If they ask you directly, what do you think about my work output? You can share in a kind way. There's no reason not to be kind at work, even with people who irritate you. I like what you've done so far on the project. I can see that you're struggling with managing all the different deliverables. When do you think that started happening? What's going on now that's causing you to struggle? Bonus, that's leadership using a coaching mindset. What does this do? Again, it establishes trust. It's a problem solving approach and it allows that person to understand that you're there to help them find a solution. You could launch into all the ways they screwed up and that if they keep screwing up, you'll have to remove them from the project. But if you don't get to the heart of what's happening, then you won't be very helpful to that person. And you may not find out that the problem is with some other factor in the project that needs to be fixed first. Constructive feedback opens a door to collaboration and allows the person who's struggling to find a path forward without judgment. It's a very powerful tool that helps you be a benevolent leader when it comes to having conversations around feedback. All right, so that's it for my video on how to improve your communication skills at work. Those were the first five communication tools. Stay tuned for part two where we cover the next five communication tools you need in your toolkit. If you have examples of how you've used any of these communication tools to your advantage, feel free to share them in the comments below. I would love to hear about them. And if you enjoyed watching this video and you found it helpful, please make sure to give it a big thumbs up by hitting that like button and make sure you're subscribed to my channel so you never miss another video from me. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.